。你知不知道？你在不在？我不知道，我不知道，我不知道，我不知道。Today's talk will be basically how to survive a crypto bear market. Now we scheduled this a few weeks ago, but obviously it's, everyone understands how the dire situation we are in right now, and that we are definitely in a bear market. So to give some background, my name is Ray. I've been in crypto for close to ten years now, and I've gone through probably four cycles. This is like this is the fourth bear market now. So just to give you guys some tips on how to survive and how to come out. Uh, better than last cycle, and what kind of things you can do to take advantage of, of this situation. So the key points that I want to emphasize is that the one, the number one most important thing is you have to survive the bear market to enjoy any profits in the next bull market. You can see already a lot of funds like Celsius, Three Arrows Capital, like a lot of these professional institutions are actually potentially blowing up. And your most important concern is to basically just have money. Available. Your portfolio might 10x, might 100x in the next cycle, but if you go to 0x now, you won't have anything to to play for. So that's the most important thing. And you might think that ETH won't drop to this level, so I'll be fine. It, it's very dangerous, especially if you're on leverage. Ethereum dropped 94% last year. If you take on leverage now,、um, and Ethereum drops 94% since all time high, it could go down to $250. So. Yeah, just brace for the worst and try not to have any kind of situation where you might lose everything. The bear market could last six months, could last six years. No one really knows, especially with global macro recession thing going on.、Uh, the past two cycles took, on average, three years to go from one all-time high to the next all-time high. So basically, you hit all-time high. It takes about three years for the price to go back up and above and beat it. It usually took twelve months. From the previous all-time high peak to discover the actual bottom. For example, if we hit forty hundred dollars on Ethereum in November of twenty twenty one, on average, it would take a whole year for you to find the actual bottom. And then the other year, you range from the bottom, you slowly climb up, and then you have pumps, and then you drop back down. You'll range for about another two years, which is why it takes three years on average to go from the all-time high to the all-time high.、And、this is just based off the last two and three cycles. Um, however, this is also the first time that crypto has been. Anyways, this is the first time that crypto has been in a global recession. So there are a few factors that that are unknowns. One one part you can say that you can have a prediction that the cycles will speed up, because people have experienced the past two cycles. They might anticipate saying, "Oh, it's not going to last twelve months because people are going to front run it because they already know it runs twelve months." They might try to get in on eight months. So the cycle itself will change because people are aware of the previous cycles. Like the meta will change. However, there's also the point where the global economy might be shit for two years, and if the global economy is shit for two years, I don't think crypto will come back for two years either. So there's a lot of different viewpoints on whether this will be just as long of a bear market, be quicker, or maybe even longer. The other thing is that basically there are actual products being built, so that's one use case where it could be less than three years. People are actually building, people are playing with NFTs. There's actually different features on all these blockchains, but I do not expect this to Recover like May of 2021. I consider May 2021 and now the same cycle. I don't consider it two different cycles. Basically, when we dropped in May, June, July, and rallied back up at the end of that last year, I consider that just basically because the, the traditional market was still pumping and it pumped to in November until everything crashed. So I consider that one cycle. Okay, so those are the key points. Now, how do you actually survive? One thing you can do is focus on. Your edge, or what you're good at, find your edge. Now, what is that? That could be long in the market, could be shorting the market, could be really good at flipping NFTs. You could be building a product, coding, writing, or teaching. So that's just something to spend your time on during the bear market, since this could last several months, if not years. The other thing is you got to set your time frames. So you might read on crypto Twitter that people are buying, or someone say I'm shorting. It doesn't actually matter what they do because their time frame is probably different than your time frame. If I'm saying I'm shorting Ethereum right now. It could very well be profitable because Ethereum might drop in price in the next month or the next week. But if you don't actually do anything the next month or week and hold it for a year, you might be screwed because you're still shorting when the market has changed. Likewise, the other the other scenario is if someone tells you to long and you follow their advice, and a month later they sell it and they don't tell you, their time frame is different than yours. Both people that are betting long or betting short can make money in this game, but your time frames don't match. So. That's just something to be aware of. So whenever, whenever your friend tells you or you read online that someone's doing a specific trade, just be wary that your time frame will be different there, than yours than theirs. The next advice is to set your basic assumptions. So, for example, my basic assumption that 
I base all my trades off of is that Ethereum will one day, Ethereum or Bitcoin, one of these major blockchains, will one day reach a new all-time high because of various reasons. One, because I believe in crypto. I think a lot of people are building on this industry. I think there's still a lot of value to be added to it. So one day in the future, say three, four years, maybe one year from now, Ethereum and Bitcoin will reach a new all-time high. And that will be my base assumption. And then throughout this bear market, it's very hard to trade, right? So you want to minimize your total actions. The less actions you take, the less mistakes you have. And out of all this, if you don't think you have an edge on any of the like NFTs or long and shorting, the best way to guarantee profitability is to just extend your time frame. So instead of trying to trade them, trading the month or trading the chop, just say I have a three, four, five year time frame, and I'm just going to buy and not sell. So if you only do one side of the trade, you won't really make any mistakes as long as the thesis comes true that one day ETH or Bitcoin and crypto goes up in value, you will have higher portfolio value after that since you've been buying the whole time and not trading. If you do trade, it's very possible that you have less ETH than before because you did a bad trade and you bought high, you sold low and you bought high essentially. So basically based on this simple solution of just long time frame, long crypto, a lot of people prefer the dollar cost average. That's a perfectly fine situation and solution. If you're worried about volatility, or if you think you'll regret if you spend all your money at once, the next slide is basically how do you average in? Again, the first one is dollar cost average. This is basically setting a specific time frame. So you can say six months every, for the next six months every week. I'm going to buy the same amount of dollar amount. So I'm going to buy twenty thousand ETH every Monday, something like that. What this will do is basically average you in. So you'll have the average price of ETH rather than the price of one day when you buy. Another method that I'm actually currently using is to set specific bids to prices of where you think ETH will hit or whatever coin you're buying. So for example, obviously these slides are a little outdated since ETH is already below 1400, but you can say I'm going to buy 20K at 1400 and then 20K at 1350 and then 20K at 1300. The actual dollar amount per, per tranche is up to you based on how much you actually want to invest and also the intervals. So this is example, I'm buying every $50. You can do every $20, you can do $100. It all depends on how frequently you wanna buy and also what your total investment size is. The thing you have to worry about this is that ETH or whatever coin you're buying may not hit your last tranche or your last few tranches. If it doesn't go down that low, once the price bounces back up, do you say, wanna just all in at that point or do you wanna wait and see if it's a dead cat bounce and slowly buy back in? So using this method, you won't get all your money in. At, you won't always get your money in. So you have to have a backup plan as to what happens if the market moves on. But this does allow you to sweep the bottom because you're not going to know what the bottom is. So you're just essentially choosing all the values and sweeping the bottom. Now, when you're actually managing a portfolio, I talked to a lot of friends that they don't really actually track the performance. So it's very hard to actually determine for all the actions you're doing, if it's actually profitable or not. So I'd say... If you have a short time frame, it's fine to denominate in US dollars. And that's what most people do. You can say I have $50,000 worth of crypto. And obviously, I'm trying to make money, right? So the next month, you have $60,000. You'll say that's profitable. I would say if you're trading back from ETH and USD back and forth, and you're, you went from $50,000 to $60,000, but your total amount of ETH actually went down, that is actually a loss. You basically did a bunch of actions and reduced the amount of ETH in your portfolio. Even though your US dollars went up, that could have just been because ETH went up. So I would say in the long time frame, you want to denominate your portfolio in ETH or BTC. I used to use BTC and now I denominate in ETH because that's what I use to buy various things, NFTs, trade, assets, and DeFi. So I pre predominantly use ETH to track my portfolio. And a simple way to do this, I just did this example on Google Spreadsheets, took me about five minutes. It's just a tracker of all the assets that one might own with the quantity and the current price you can pull from. There's a Google formula for that. For the other smaller coins, you have to use CoinGecko's API, but that's fairly easy as well. And it updates every time you refresh the page. So this is just a snapshot. If someone were to own this portfolio, you can see their balance and create a pie chart. And then you can actually calculate your specific net worth in dollars, Bitcoins, and, and ETH. In this, in this example, he has, or he or she has a net worth of 608 Ethereum. And what your goal should be is every action should be something in some way to try to get more ETH over time. And this is all based on because of our original thesis that ETH one day will reach an all-time high. When that ETH hits all-time high, your net worth will also be all-time high because you've been priority total number of ETH. 
right? If you, in the short term, you can prod it as US dollar, but in the long term, you're basing it off your initial thesis and you're just trying to stack more Bitcoin or Ethereum. So that's how I've been measuring my own performance in a bear market. Because look, in a bear market, everyone's going to be down in USD. Like you, there's no point in trying to outperform USD. So common mistakes, if you trade, if you do one trade, the market moves against you. It's very common to do something called revenge trading or try to make it back. That will usually result in more mistakes. Again, more actions, more mistakes. Another mistake is investing without conviction. So conviction is something that you can't really get. It's like someone really can't teach you conviction. So I can tell my friend about Bitcoin. And I've done this before many times. I taught my, I told my friend about Bitcoin when it was $800. It dipped to 600. He sold. It did to 400 and he was really happy he got out and then he never bought back in. So that was a horrible trade because he didn't have conviction in Bitcoin, saw the price go down 20%, sold, and then just forgot about it. This same with if you're shorting the market or buying the market, you need to have pretty strong conviction so that you have to wait for your trade to play out. Another mistake is trade a chop. This is a chart that was like last week. You can see one day, look how volatile this is. And really there's no point trying to trade daily charts. You're just going to get killed in this current atmosphere because it's just gambling at this point, trying to figure out where the price is going to go. And the last one is leverage. This is everyone's seen it now is like even professionals are basically blowing up, even with just a little bit of leverage. You might take 10% leverage, 20% leverage. Normally that's safe, but if crypto drops 90%, you're still going to get liquidated. So any sort of leverage in the long term will most likely get you liquidated in crypto because crypto goes through 90% drawdowns. So in the short term, it might be okay if you do a one week trade and you lever up, but in the long term, if you plan to hold it, you will most likely bust. Okay. So this is interesting. So this is, if we want to predict how long this bear market will last, first of all, no one knows we're all guessing at this point, but what we can do is we can study past cycles. So I'll, I'll jump into the charts after the slide, but just to give some context in 2013, Bitcoin had a cycle. It fell 85%. It had a peak of $1,200 and it fell all the way down to $170. And for reference, the market cap went from 13 billion to 2 billion. But from $170, it then performed 110X in the 2018 cycle. So it, it dropped 85% and then it went up 110X. ETH didn't exist in 2013. So that's why I only did Bitcoin. And in 2018 cycle, again, Bitcoin fell over 80% from 19K to 3K. Uh, market cap was significantly larger from 330 billion to 56 billion. And then from the 3K bottom, it went 23X to 69K this year. So from the absolute bottom, it did another 23X. Likewise, ETH again fell 94%, huge amount, 1400 down to 80. Market cap went from 140 billion to 8.5 billion. And then from the $80 bottom, it did 60X this cycle to 4,800. So a lot of people are comparing, you know, Obviously, smaller market cap, you're going to have larger increases and also larger drawdowns. So people are predicting that ETH may perform similar to Bitcoin last cycle because the market caps were similar. So maybe ETH 2022 will perform like Bitcoin 2018, something like that, because we could see potentially see 80 something percent drawdown. Again, this is just speculating based off of what's happened in the past. And people are speculating layer one coins that are in the range of ETH last cycle, the 100 billion peak cycle, which is like Solana, they might drop 90 plus percent. So that's very possible. And we are almost trending in that direction anyways. So that's how we can see potential drawdowns. You can see the chart here. You can, if you look at this chart, this is what we currently are right now. And we're still in the downward phase. So there's a Twitter post that I retweeted recently. A bear market really has three phases. You have, can you guys see my mouse? I'm not sure if you can see my mouse maybe. Okay. The first part of the bear market is like this part right here. And this part, you're not sure it's a bear market yet because obviously this happened as well. So you're like, it's just a dip. It could correct back. And it's true. No one knows because it could correct back. And then you get to here and it's at this point, you're like, okay, it's correcting back. It's fine. We're still going to go higher. And then this happens and you're like, fuck, okay, so now we're in a bear. Once it's down like 60%, air, like literally it was here that people agree that it was a bear market. Okay. Now we're going to probably finally find the bottom and then have this huge one year period potentially of just going up and down. You can see last cycle, it was basically this entire period, which was 700, 800 days long where, and, the, and this is very volatile too. From the bottom here to the top here, that was a 300% pump. That's three X. So you can experience a three X pump and everyone FOMOs back in. And then you drop from here all the way back down. You drop 60% again. 
So we're going to have extreme volatility, but when you zoom out, you won't see it that much. If you zoom out, if you look at like this to here, that's 800 days. That's rough. So I don't know if we're going to have that long of a bear market, but that's just something to expect. This is 2018 Bitcoin. If we go to 2013 Bitcoin right here, similar, we're still in the phase that's dropping down right now. And then once you find a bottom, this whole period, 300 days right here, 300 days. And the price is actually very, obviously there's a sharp drop down to 160, 170, but from like 200, like it's, it was stayed at 200 for 200, 300 days. So if you actually want to buy close to the bottom and it, and if the bear market is similar to previous cycles, you will have a lot of time. And this is where people basically quit. Your friends will stop talking about crypto. People will start losing money. All these web three smaller apps will just go silent. This is the third phase of the bear market, which is the exhaustion phase and people just quit and give up. This is the part where you should, a few things, you should continually buy crypto if you have money to invest. This is the best time to accumulate. Same as this part right here. Now, obviously we can still have another drawdown, but long-term, this part is where you want to start accumulating. I think we're still in the steep portion of dropping down. Like we haven't even flat, we haven't had this period yet. So you could obviously buy some right now. I am also buying some right now. I, I predict a long period where you can buy. And you'll notice that crypto Twitter will be more inactive. People will be, I don't know, going back to Facebook to work and web two and whatnot. But the important thing is to not completely forget about crypto because a lot of people, a lot of my friends have basically, so basically one major mistake is to forget about crypto entirely and never come back. And you don't hear about, you won't hear about it until maybe over here, Bitcoin goes up to 50 K and you read a Bloomberg article saying crypto is back and you would have missed uh, quite a bit of gains. So that's the biggest advice is to two things. One, you can't get burnt out because if you keep staring at the charts for 300 days, you're going to get burnt out. And I think one thing that helped me was that when I went through these two bears, I actually didn't work in web three. Obviously now it's a lot more convenient to work in Web3 and so you have a lot more job stability. But in the early days, no one knew that crypto was actually going to survive. So people that actually worked on it gave up. A lot of people gave up. A lot of Bitcoin developers gave up and threw in the towel and quit and sold all their coins. It's actually a very famous Twitter post where a guy rage quit, a Bitcoin core developer rage quit at $300 and then literally two months after the bull market. So that's one thing is you need to find some kind of hobby outside of crypto to actually have a mental state to survive and actually still care about it somewhat and follow it, but you don't need to track the prices every day. And the next one is once you actually see the engagement start rising and prices start climbing again, then you can actually, you know, start getting more active into this space again. So I think we have a lot of time to, to build essentially the build. And then the next cycle, I think won't start until we get close to the all time high of, the, of this current cycle. You want to, you want to get in before the line starts so you can capture this move up. So in this example, I would want to see Bitcoin or Equin to break above 50K or so. Once it breaks this, I think people will start getting interested. A lot of retail people will be listening to Bloomberg news talking about crypto coming back. And it's not too late to get in at that point because we have that move to capture. And if we look at back on these slides here, if ETH went 60X this cycle, if it performs like Bitcoin last cycle, it could go 20X from the bottom. So. Even trading something like Ethereum will have still have a lot of gains. And if you look at Solana and Avalanche and these other layer one chains, they could go 60x because that's what Ethereum did this cycle. They could go more than 50x. But again, we don't know what the bottom is. They could drop another 80%. Moving on to this line, I'm not going to, I share the link, but I'm not going to click on it. But basically, this is a very good blog post by Avi Feldman. And he basically says, the difference between investing and trading is actually not that different. The only thing that's different is time, fr time frame. A trader and investor does the exact same thing. And basically everything in life you do is a trade. Do you want to go to school and study as this major or another major, right? That's still a trade that you have to evaluate the pros and cons. And he basically gives this chart of long-term versus short-term. If you're short-term, then you're considered a trader. If you're long-term, you're considered an investor. But you should just consider everything as a trade. And basically you should take a look at this article and just helps you give a good framework of how do you decide on the actions that you do? Because you can decide, oh, maybe right now I think the markets are going down, I should buy stable coins. These are all decisions that you have to make and they will impact your portfolio in the end. Uh, and some final words before we go into questions. Again, I talked about this earlier, just make sure you find 
way to balance between work, life, and crypto. Because if you keep trading and keep getting yourself involved, like trying to dive into this when it's a bear market that could last potentially a thousand days, a lot of people do get burnt out and then they miss the next cycle. I try not to lose interest, but also don't burn out. The next one is build conviction for long-term investments. So the people that actually make the most money in these bull markets are the ones that have extremely strong conviction and keep buying in the bear market. Now, obviously, if you keep buying an asset that sucks and doesn't, it's not, it's not a good quality. It's very possible that you won't actually make money in the next bull market. But I think it's very high chance you just buy Bitcoin, just buy ETH, maybe Solana or Avalanche. Those two, I think, are a little bit more risky. For me personally, I would wait to see the next bull market start or more infra being developed before I ape into those in large size during a bull. Uh, sorry, during a bear market. But Bitcoin and ETH, they're fairly safe for. In, in my opinion, to just start dollar cost averaging throughout the whole um, bear market. And you're not going to guess like the one Shiba Inu coin or the one Dogecoin that pumps during the bull. So I never even look at those meme coins. I would say real wealth here, like generational wealth is basically allocating assets into these things that can grow 10 to 100x. If you if you just think about, let's say ETH falls another 50% from here, that would be got like $600, dollars $700. $700. But then if you if it goes 20x, just imagine any investment that you've done since then go at least 10 to 20x above that. Swing trading, if you're trading short term, you can make 30% profit here and there, but that isn't really going to give you that generational 10 to 100x or even 1000x profit. And the last one here is basically most investors that actually get to a large portfolio size, like life-changing money. They can usually count the trades that gave them that profit in one hand. It's usually just four or five trades that were 10 to 100 X's. Imagine if you obviously, yeah, this cycle has been very brutal since we've also seen people go 100 to zero. And obviously Luna is the one example here where if you were a seed investor in Luna, you would have made millions of dollars. And obviously if you held it, you would have gone to zero too. But yeah, truly if I would say most people, if they're participating in this space, and if you're in this, if you're investing full time with some decent size, it doesn't have to be like hundreds of thousands of dollars, but if you put, put quite a bit in, in two cycles, and if you actually get the assets correctly, in two cycles, you can make quite life-changing money. If you do one cycle, but somehow magically time the top and type the bottom, you could, yeah, one cycle. I've seen people make over 200x in one cycle and they're just like done. But I, I think one, once you're in crypto, you're in it for a lot of time. So I never see people leave and quit. And then this is a quote that I liked. I, I forgot what this was. Yeah, this is basically just about building conviction and having a long time frame and managing risk. I think that's the last slide. Any questions? So I think something that stood out to me was your, your, when you said conviction can't be toxic. Can you share kind of what, how you build your conviction starting 10 years ago through the four cycles you've been through? Yeah, I started with Bitcoin, obviously, and it was everyone's personality and everyone's interests are different. So I initially was really attracted to Bitcoin because I played a lot of online games and I found a lot of value in digital assets. So trading RuneScape gold for some item, like I used to sell RuneScape gold for cash in high school to friends and then play like Diablo 2 and sold items for cash. So from an early age, I believed in transferring value online. And you couldn't really do that with PayPal. PayPal didn't actually let you transfer in-game currency for cash. And then with crypto, I was like, okay, cool. This is cool. You can actually buy stuff. Obviously, in the beginning, it was just Silk Road. But then you start seeing vendors. You start, you start seeing platforms like, uh, uh, what is it? Like, is it BitGo? Or is it BitPay? And the vendors start taking crypto. And now it's actually very easy to send crypto. Like, a lot of times, if you want to settle funds, uh, people just take stable coins now. So th seeing that space grow has been like backing up my thesis of this like digital currency narrative and then also just seeing the space grow because like you guys when you guys if you join this cycle this industry is already very large you go to any of these conventions there's thousands of people i think consensus had sixteen thousand people go and permissionless had eight thousand people go but in 2013 the bitcoin conference had 200. so i think from my perspective just seeing how much people are joining this space and you don't see a lot of people leaving other than just like the people that were were blown out during the bull market when they lost money. But I'm seeing a lot of people, a lot of see talent bleeding in, a lot of tech companies <laughs> starting to build their own layer one platforms. So my conviction has just grown over time. It wasn't super strong right off the bat and I'm just going to hold it. There are 
some people like that. There are also max, they call them like maxis, like Bitcoin maxis, ETH maxis. I tried to be more open-minded on new projects that are being built because when I first started, I was a Bitcoin maxi because everything else was a scam. Everything else did fail. And then because of that, I missed out on Ethereum and I missed out on like 10,000X gains potentially, basically. So now I try out the different protocols. You should still be cognizant of all the other potential risks and hacks and scams. So a lot of it is learning from mistakes. Like I did get scammed before. I lost like 20 Bitcoin back when it was like a thousand dollars total. But you, yeah, just one other mindset is assume that everything is a scam. That's one way to avoid scams. Like anyone that wants to message you to trade or to click this link, just assume everything is a scam. There's no reason for someone to reach. If there's no reason for someone to reach out to you, it's yeah, it's just, you should always be scared of when someone wants something from you. And that's something I learned from RuneScape too. It's just like, you get scammed a lot in video games. Okay, so you're comparing like BTC and then the next cycle is BTC Ethereum. But this cycle was noticeable, I think, is the introduction of NFTs. How do you think about NFTs looking at the next or the next couple of years to spear market? So I think this is interesting. I think an NFT can basically, let's say an NFT collection like Bored Apes, it could essentially be compared to as a an altcoin. It is an altcoin. It is a coin. The collection itself has a community and it has people working on it and it has people building on it. And similar to other altcoins, if the community survives the bear market and the developers keep building and there's and they're growing their actual fan base and they're growing, then I can see it surviving and then potentially having a new all-time high. But also I would say the majority of them might give up, the developers will give up, or the community just gets smaller and smaller. That's the same thing as altcoins in the bear. People just start undercutting each other and then the price will go down. And then in the next cycle, there needs to be a reason for the coin to pump. I think if there is an NFT cycle in the next market, those floor prices will probably go up because everything goes up in crypto when things go up, but they probably will underperform the new projects because again, the team's not working on it and uh, there's no narrative for that coin to pump anymore. Obviously you might have some really random thing like how Shiba Inu came out of nowhere and pumped out of nowhere, same with Dogecoin, but you can't really bet on those happening. Just consider an NFT collection or community as a separate token. Like for example, let's say like Cardano or something like that. Some people buy Cardano and if they actually deliver a product that people use, then the price will go up. I think the price will reflect that. But if it's just all speculation, it's very possible for, I own a lot of Azukis and I think that it will be tough. I hope they will build and keep building and provide value, but they have to survive the bear and then basically survive until the next narrative happens. You also have to be aware that the next cycle, which is let's say two years from now, NFTs can be completely different. So you have to be aware that if the developers are still on the team, then you know they have to kind of figure out what the new narrative for NFTs are, how they're being used. And if all NFTs are used a different way, these old cycle NFTs, like no one's going to trade these NFTs anymore. Like no one trades, like Icon was like a Korean project in 2017 or Verge. Like all these like 2017 coins that did 100x. No one traded them. They traded the new ones. They traded Solana. They traded Avalanche. They traded Sol yeah, Solana, Luna, and Avalanche and all these other coins. But most of the 2017 coins died. Some of them survived. Ethereum obviously survived. BNB did very well. So there's a few that did well, but 99% of them basically went to zero. They don't go to zero, but they basically go to infinity. What are your thoughts on application specific layer ones? So for example, an NFT specific layer one or a DeFi specific layer one that only, so things like injective. Uh, yeah, my, my idea here is that I'm not the best like early investor. So if someone has like an idea that's not built yet and it's like, this is their seed idea. For me, it's very hard to see the, see how it will turn out. For me, I want to see, like for me, I get it. If I can use it, try it out and then I can actually see this thing working. So for me, even in Ethereum, I got in pretty late. I didn't start doing DeFi until yield farming actually started. So I didn't really, I never used MetaMask until yield farm, yield farming was around because I saw no point using MetaMask to move coins around for no purpose. But then once I saw these function, this functionalities being created, then I saw the use case. So when you say like a blockchain for a specific purpose, I think, yeah, of course it work, but will the market, will the users actually use it? Do you have the marketing ability to attract people to use it? And I think that's the hard part, right? So you can say, oh, I want to create an app where you get paid to run. And maybe this will work, maybe it won't work, but you can't really predict the, the crazy FOMO that will happen with Stepin. Now, obviously, I don't know if Stepin will 
perform well in one or two years, but the initial spike, that's not something that I'm able to predict. I think app specific chains, there's some kind of a product there, but I don't know how it would look like. So I would like to see actual users on it. Uh, you guys should listen to uh, the Block Crunch podcast with what's it called? Jordan Salini. Jordan from S- Jordan from Salini Capital or something like that. Jordy kind of has a similar, <laughs> but his is a little bit more macro based. I don't know much about macro. I'm just following the news and trying to buy more as it gets cheaper. Yeah, if no one else has any other questions, I'll, I'll, I'll have another one. Do you have a? Can you run through your security best practices? Security best. Um, so I always use a ledger. <laughs> Somebody's mic is. Uh, Anyways, I always use a ledger and I don't install any random, like I use a Mac, so I feel that's like somewhat a little bit safer. I don't click on random executable files. I don't ever use ledger on my phone either. Always use two-factor authentication. If you're trading on exchange, you should always have two-factor authentication. If you're, if you use Binance or FTX and you come, if you travel to the US, I would always use a VPN. Um, I've had friends from Taiwan, they're Taiwanese, they come to the US, they log in at Binance, and then their IP is based in the USA, and they get locked. And then Binance will say, please mail me your proof of address in Taiwan, proving that you're this person. And then they don't have their phone bill with them in the US, so they can't, they're locked. Now their funds are stuck, they can't trade, and they're fucked. If you're trading on an exchange, make sure you're using a VPN if you're based in a different country. Uh, most exchanges don't want US-based clients so that's something to keep in mind of but yeah just uh, don't i have discord dms blocked because i assume anyone that dms me is wanting to scam me twitter i allow people to dm me on twitter but like i won't click on any links and i'm not i don't think i'm overly cautious it's more just common sense if you feel like someone's messaging you because they want something from you it's most likely a scam yeah and just if it's too good to be true it's better to be safe than sorry same with all these like airdrops right the airdrop could be safe, but I'm just going to wait a couple hours for someone else to, if you can't read the code, then wait some time and have some other people try it first. Yeah. Thanks for the presentation. I'm actually pretty new to the space and pretty curious about how, like your take on how the game industry is responding to what's been happening in the market, especially with regards to NFTs. Are there any games you see currently that you feel are doing it right coming from someone who used to play RuneScape and all these other games? Right now, I haven't seen any good use cases that are built out for NFTs and games. People are talking about, oh, it'd be great to imagine this sword was an NFT. I think that would be cool, but I haven't actually seen it in practice and built out. The only like games that I've played that have caught somewhat attention was like DeFi Kingdoms, and I wouldn't even consider that a game. DeFi Kingdoms was like 1% one, 1% 1 of the quality of Pokemon Red like 20 years ago. So the quality of DeFi games are so bad that they're worse than if you guys ever play like mini clip or those like online games when you're in like elementary school, they're worse than those right now. So I would want to see a game. I think DeFi games, they need to be, they need to start off very simple. It needs to be something like Bejeweled or Candy Crush and some have some kind of NFT structure behind it first because people are trying to build super complex games, um, but they're focusing too much on the tokenomics and then the game suffers and then everything dies. And you have to realize that games, don't have an infinite lifespan. Like you, you look at all these new games on Twitch, they're top streaming on Twitch for two weeks. And then it goes back to the original games like League of Legends, Fortnite, Hearthstone or whatever. Like most games, they don't last that long. Even big MMOs, they last for a year or two and then the community moves on. So it's tough to say with games. I haven't seen any good games where I'm like, man, this is really integrated really well. And I wouldn't like step, I don't think step in's gonna last that long unless they change something, but like running to earn, it's a cool concept, but I think that's like an app for something else, not just a game. It's not a full on game by itself. For sure. I appreciate the insight. Thank you. Uh, do you have favorite sources of information that is reliable? Yeah. So I basically have two different channels. One is podcast. I have a bunch of podcasts that I listen to. So when I work out, I just block crunch, the block, Delphi digital. The two favorite podcasts that I have actually is the chopping block recently came out. It's with a bunch of VCs from Dragonfly and Robert Leshner from Compound. They recently had a guest speaker, Mani from Multicoin Capital. They do, it's usually like four or five people in the podcast. And they usually talk about recent events. So they'll talk about recent hacks, they'll talk about the Luna explosion, they'll talk about certain things, but those people are all very knowledgeable because they've all built, they've either 
built protocols or are in VCs that are very active in the space. So I really like that podcast. They're quite active. All, I'm sorry, not all in is, that one's good, but it's not really crypto related. I also really like Up Only uh, with Ledger and Kobe because Kobe has been in the space just as long as I have. So he has a very similar mindset that I do in terms of like how he considers investing, what he thinks are scams and how he sees the space. They're not super active in uploading videos, but they do have some old content that's pretty good. So those two are probably my favorite, but then I also listen to a bunch of the stuff from the normal, typical blockchain podcasts. And then the other one is basically Twitter, but Twitter, you really have to cater your feed and find the right people to follow. One person that I really like following right now is Chris Berninski on Twitter. He has a lot of good takes. If you guys recall, he's actually the person that ran the crypto fund for ARK, find ARK before he left, but he has a very similar kind of investing style that I do as well. So I ask him for, I have a jam with him on certain ideas and seeing where the market is. But if you do read Twitter, you'll notice that there's going to be ideas and thoughts of all different dimensions. People are going to short right now because it's you know, going to go down, but somebody else is going to buy right now because things going to go up. Again, their time frames are going to be different. If you're long-term oriented, you should try to find some ideas that are more long-term oriented and not follow someone that's a trader. And then Delphi Digital, I pay their monthly subscription just so that they, they, I have a daily email roll up. You don't technically need those if you're just scrolling Twitter all day and reading those articles, but it is a good source where if you don't have all the time to read all the articles, you get a, you pay for a subscription where they basically write about what actually happened. And, but yeah, it's basically news and podcasts and Twitter. All right, Kai here. So just a small question again on your strategy about perhaps not entirely going to stables, but having that conviction to maybe stay in a denominated currency such as, but yep. if you have that conviction long-term and if you know that, okay, if you've mentioned we're going down in a bear market, isn't it still even better to go into stables? Because if you know that prices, we still got a lot of margin to go down from here. And if you don't make the trade to stables, you basically also lost out. Even if you have that long-term conviction and, okay, I'm going to buy into Ether back again with at least the capital that I have now. Even even with that conviction, it's still better <laughs> to go into stables because you it's, don't have that. Uh, it, it depends. It really depends on where you are in the market because ETH is at $1,100, $1,200 right now. I would only go back to stables if I have very high certainty that it will go to 100 or 700 because if it goes to 950 and then pumps back up to 1400, now what are you going to, you did go lower than your 1200 sell price, but you didn't buy, you forgot to buy. And then if it slowly creeps up, you maybe it'll drop next week to 900. Maybe it won't, maybe it creeps up and you didn't buy. And then now it's 1700 and 1800 and 1900. And then now you're stuck at stables. So the problem with that is that it really depends on what price you're buying and how certain you are that the price will go down and when you plan to buy back in. Because if you sold back to stables and the train just leaves without you, now you are done. You're stuck in stables. You're not done. As someone that's trying to invest in this space, you cannot afford to miss the train. And if you do miss a train, you will, you'll, it's a very painful, I would say it's more painful to miss the train than to hold the bag for another three years because you're not losing ETH or you're not losing as long as it goes back up and makes new all-time highs, you, will, you won't you will lose money. You actually just have to wait longer. But if you miss the train, then you it's very, okay. The problem what I have is if you sell and the price keeps going up and you really did miss the train, it's very hard to buy back in because you're going to spend money. You're going to spend all your money and you know that you lost all those coins, right? If the price goes up right now to 2000 and you sold at 1000, you would have 50% less coins than you did before because the price did 2X. So it's very hard mentally to buy back in knowing that you have less amount of coins than before. So that's, I think, yeah, it, it depends on your confidence of when it goes down and also when do you plan to buy back in? That's the that's tough right. question. I'll be honest, I'm already starting to buy. So I've already started buying at this level. So I would not consider selling. One thing you could do is say, this is just one potential trade. I'm not saying it's going to be right, but one way you can think of this is that I really, you could say, I believe the bear market will last another 18 months. And I believe the bottom is not in yet. Now, what happens is the price of Ethereum is 1200 right now. It might go to 1900. It might pump because of some random news. Maybe the Fed rates on Wednesday is like good news and it pumps to 1900. You can say, I don't believe this pump is real. So I'm going to sell on the pump and then wait for it to bleed and then buy back in. That's something you can do also. 
but you also have to realize that maybe it doesn't bleed or maybe you have to wait a long time for it to bleed. If you look at, if you look at this chart, and if I go to ETH USD, I messed up right here. I sold that 3,500 at one point, like right here. And then I bought some here and then I just kept it the whole time. And then now I'm down here and I kept it. And I would have been better if I just never bought back in here. Even though I bought back in here and I thought I was a genius for capturing this move, I never bought, I never sold. So now I'm actually down. Just because you do one action, you have to get the other action to actually make money on that. So that's just one example where basically I sold and I bought and then it would have been better if I did nothing. Like for one moment, you think you made it great progress and then six months later, you're down. Right, yeah, yeah, totally get that. Thanks. Yep. It's great talk. <laughs> Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if you guys have Thank any you, questions, Ray. you guys can always DM me on Twitter or Telegram. Pretty active. Thanks, Thanks Ray. Ray. That was amazing. Thanks, Ray. Yep. Amazing. Yep. Thank you, Ray. Thank you, Ray. Thank, Thank you, Ray. Uh, Thank you. Definitely need that list of all the Twitter people. Should we do? Should we do a group photo?